Well, hello everyone, and um, welcome to the Posture Right Friday webinar. Um, very quickly, just a few admin points before we begin. Um, if you have any questions, you should have a question box on your screen. Um, please send them across during the webinar, and we'll try to answer some of them at the end of the presentation. Those that we don't get a chance to answer, we'll ask um, our pre presenters here to answer them, um, and they should be available on our website along with the presentation from the beginning of next week. Um, CPD certificates um, at some point should be sent out next week. And finally, if you've got any technical issues, the presentation will be available on our website, and the link is www.posturites.co.uk forward slash webinars. Um, well, today's presentation is based on resilience um, and is presented by Sadia, who's the founder and director of Integrated Health, um, with more than sort of 13 years' experience and a background in physical and psychological well being. Sadia is one of the industry's most thought-provoking practitioners. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Sadia to, to introduce his presentation and, and to go on with it. Thank you, Sadia. Thank you, James, and many thanks to Posture Right for asking me to present this webinar on resilience. And good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. Today, we will be looking at what is resilience, why it is important, the relationship between resilience and stress, how to develop it, and how integrated health can help you develop resist resilience. Please feel free to submit your questions while the webinar is proceeding, and I'll try to answer them at a later stage. On some of the slides, you will notice references to credible scientific publications so that you know the talk is evidence-based. Resilience appears to be a bit of a buzzword at the moment, but what does resilience actually mean? Resilience comes from the Latin verb resilire, which means to jump back. There are many definitions in the research, but the one that works for me is that resilience is sustained positive functioning in the face of significant physical and or psychological challenge. It is having the ability to physically and psychologically maintain and regain your balance or equilibrium. Whilst the body and mind are intimately connected, Today we'll be focusing on psychological resilience. Psychological resilience is the mental processes and behaviors and the individual uses to protect them from the negative effects of stress. The psychologists think about resilience in two ways, a trait and a process. A trait is a characteristic or quality that a person has that causes them to behave in a certain way. For example, Think of a friend and how you would describe them. You may describe them as kind, honest, or outgoing. These are all traits, and resilience can be regarded as a trait as well. Resilience can also be conceived as a process. By this I mean that it will vary from situation to situation, throughout a situation, and it changes across a person's life. This explains why you're able to keep your cool and composure in one situation, but can get completely overwhelmed by another. I would like to suggest trying not to think of resilience as a fixed trait, in that you either have it or you don't. Instead, try to think of resilience as a muscle. In some people, that muscle is naturally stronger than in others, but it can grow stronger in everyone with exercise and all muscles require the balance between exercise and rest in order to keep them in shape. So too with resilience, it can be exercised in an individual to grow stronger. Resilience is important in that it relates to well-being and both physical and mental health. Statistics show that in the UK, about one in four people will experience a diagnosable mental health problem in a year. One in six people right now are experiencing anxiety, depression, or unmanageable stress. A person spends on average about 14 hours a week worrying. Suicide remains the most common cause of death in men under the age of 35. One in four women will require treatment for depression, and nine out of ten people with a mental health problem experience stigma and discrimination. 
From an organizational perspective in the UK, the Health and Safety Executive tells us that stress, anxiety and depression accounted for 39% of all work-related illnesses in the 2013 and 14 financial year. The total number of working days lost due to stress, depression and anxiety was 11.3 million in 2013 and 14 with an average of 23 days per case. It is clearly evident that mental health is an issue in the UK. Mental health is closely associated with physical health and the world in which we live. Our developed Western society is very different to the environment of our ancestors in that we are no longer trying to just survive, no longer threatened by predators, and not faced with a scarcity of resources like food and water. Today, the developed societies tend to be engaged with fear, worry, guilt, social conflict or isolation, and overwork. This coupled with the on-the-go 24-7 culture, readily available, caloric-rich, nutritionally dense or nutritionally poor food, disrupted sleep cycles, technology, and being less physically active are all taking a toll on us. Increased obesity, increased heart disease, increased cancer, and increased mental health problems are all testimony to this. Research has thus been focusing on resilience as a possible aid to help reduce the negative impacts that our modern stressful lifestyle has on our bodies and minds. And from an organizational perspective, research suggests that resilience is positively related to high work performance. In order to fully appreciate the importance of resilience, we need to understand its relationship with stress. From the onset, it is worth clarifying that stress is not a disease, like pneumonia or HIV. Stress is not a feeling or emotion like sadness or anger. Stress is a psychological construct. It is a concept that allows us to understand what is happening to people in different situations and why ill health may arise. There are many models of stress, but the transactional model of stress and coping from psychology is the most encompassing. In this model, stress is seen as a process involving transactions between a person and their environment and the focus is on how the person reacts. Stress occurs when the perceived demands or pressure placed on a person exceeds their perceived ability to cope. In the diagram, you see that the model is depicted like a seesaw in a playground. On the one side of the seesaw, you see the stressor or situation. On the other side, you have the concept of coping resources and the fulcrum of the seesaw is the concept of appraisal. So, when faced with a stressor, a person evaluates the potential threat, and this is called primary appraisal. A person makes a judgment about the significance of a situation as stressful, positive, controllable, challenging, or irrelevant. If the situation is deemed to be threatening, then the person engages in secondary appraisal to work out how best to deal with the situation and change the undesirable conditions, i.e. the person's ability to cope. And coping can be defined as the strategies, either mental or physical, internal or external, that a person uses when in a perceived threatening situation. For example, your manager assigns you a task with a deadline. On primary appraisal, you perceive this as threatening. On secondary appraisal, you look to what can be done about the situation. You look to your internal coping resources, such as your ability to focus, and your external coping resources, such as your colleagues at work who can assist you. You perceive that you can cope. The seesaw now tips in favor of coping. You now feel a buzz about doing the assigned task, 
and you feel motivated to meet the deadline and get cracking with the task. Chances are that the outcome will most likely be desirable and that you will meet the deadline. <clears throat> now let's look at a different scenario. Your manager assigns you the same task with a deadline. On primary appraisal, you perceive this as threatening. On secondary appraisal, you look to your internal coping resources and you believe that you will do a poor job and you won't meet the deadline. And your colleagues are away on annual leave and there's no one to help you. You perceive the situation as stressful. The seesaw now tips in favor of the stress. The effects of the stress will manifest according to the individual. On a mental level, perhaps in the form of negative self-dialogue, such as, I can't do this. On an emotional level, with anxiety. On a physical level, with increased blood pressure, tension in your neck and your shoulders. And on a behavioral level, possibly with procrastination. The outcome is most likely going to be undesirable. And this has the potential to create an unhelpful cycle and pattern whenever you are asked to do a similar task in the future. What should be emphasized from the transactional model is that stress is an individual experience. It does not matter whether the demands placed on the person are objectively high, but whether they are perceived as high. It doesn't matter whether a person actually has control, but rather whether they think they have control. It is the person's appraisal of the situation and their response to the situation that determines the outcome. For example, a job interview for one person may be considered a threat, and another person may consider it a challenge and so too for job promotion. Stephen Covey summarized it best by saying, between stimulus and response, you have the right to choose. From the model, it follows that balance cannot be achieved by just controlling the stressful situations that life throws at us. A life without stressful situations is as likely as a life without pain. Stressful situations, like pain, are to some extent a normal part of life. In fact, the research shows that people with a history of some lifetime adversity reported better mental health and well-being outcomes than people with no history of adversity. So to achieve balance in the model, and ultimately, in a person, we need to address both the coping resources a person has at their disposal, as well as how a person responds to a situation. And resilience appears to be the key to helping us to develop this balance. Research into resilience has revealed some of the characteristics that influence whether a person deems a situation to be threatening or not. One such factor is hardiness. Hardiness is made up of three things. Firstly, being committed to finding meaningful purpose in life. Secondly, the belief that one can influence one's surroundings and the outcome of events. And thirdly, the belief that one can learn and grow from both positive and negative life experiences. What is noteworthy here is that your beliefs can help you develop resilience. And we will touch on this point later in the webinar. Another factor that appears to be a source of adult resilience is a secure relationship with a primary caregiver in the very early years of human life. Based on this relationship, the infant learns to trust and love others and be confident that it will be protected in the event of a threat. 
the positive emotions of trust and love have been related to positive health outcomes and improved recovery from pain. Hardiness and positive emotions are closely related to another factor that influences resilience, namely self-esteem. How you see yourself, how much you accept yourself, how much you value yourself, determine your self-worth. Self-esteem is intertwined with self-efficacy, your belief that you can achieve a future goal, and self-regulation, your ability to resist temptation, urges and cravings, otherwise known as willpower. Your religious and spiritual beliefs can influence your resilience. This relates to what I mentioned earlier regarding the person living a meaningful and purposeful life. Hope has many definitions and has a connection to religious and spiritual beliefs in the form of faith and is associated with optimism. Hopelessness is often used as a predictor for mental health conditions such as depression. And there is a relationship between hope and coping. Coping fosters hope when it is low and hope fosters and sustains coping over the long term. Hope is particularly relevant in our world of managing uncertainty and coping with a changing reality. Speaking of change, research into organizational change has shown that resilience and organizational inducement led to employees being more supportive of change and committed to staying in the organization. Acceptance is an active state that enables an individual to live with potentially distressing experiences. It is the opposite of resisting and is also different from tolerance, which has a sense of putting up with a situation. Acceptance is often associated with being present and seeing a situation for what it is without trying to change it. Vulnerability is a resilience trait that is gaining traction after Brene Brown's TED Talk and the publication of her Shame Resilience Theory. Vulnerability relates to how comfortable a person is with being exposed to the possibility of being harmed or attacked, either physically or emotionally. Emotional vulnerability looks at the expression of our universal desires to love, to belong, and to connect. What is interesting for me about the trait of emotional vulnerability is that it challenges the very British notion of keeping a stiff upper lip. It is in fact the assertive expression of our emotions that helps us to develop resilience. Dr. Brown's work showed that emotional vulnerability is adversely affected by shame. She describes shame as the belief that we are not good enough. That there is something about us that if other people see it or know it would make us unworthy of love, belonging and connection. She proposed that talking about shame, having empathy, changing our internal self-dialogue, practicing gratitude and changing our limiting beliefs are, are all antidotes to shame and the development of emotional vulnerability. It is interesting to note that a lot of research has looked at resilience in people who are, who are responding to a challenge, for example, natural disasters, death, and so on. But the research has also started to now focus on those individuals who actively seek out challenges. For example, Olympic champions, soldiers, and participants of endurance events such as the Marathon de Sable, and so on. In this group of people, effective action under stressful situations is imperative. 
In Olympic athletes, positive personality, motivation, confidence, focus, and perceived social support have been identified as traits that foster resilience. In soldiers and frontline workers such as firefighters and paramedics, traits that enhance resilience include an ability to bond with a group with a common mission, a high value placed on altruism, and that they are courageous. And courage is the ability to face and confront fear, pain, danger, and uncertainty, and take action in spite of it. All these traits influence resilience by changing the way a person appraises a situation. Resilient people tend to see a seemingly stressful situation as less threatening. Resilient people are thus in a better position to choose how to respond to a situation and be creators of their quality of life. There is a common misconception that people who are resilient experience no negative emotions or thoughts and display optimism in all situations. Contrary to this misconception, resiliency is demonstrated with individuals who can effectively and relatively easily navigate their way around stressful situations and utilize effective methods of coping. Developing resilience is a personal journey. People do not all react the same to traumatic and stressful life events. An approach to building resilience that works for one person might not work for another. People use varying strategies. And the same can also be said for an organization and how it chooses to engage with developing resilience. Some of us may already do resilience building activities without even realizing it. For example, some of us may run marathons, or some of us may do the trendy 5-2 diet where you pseudo fast for two days of the week. Just as stress is an individual experience, so too is developing resilience. And this can be influenced by social cultural factors. For example, some cultures have an extended family network that rally together in a stressful situation. While some organizations may have an unsupportive, blaming, and individualistic way of dealing with stressful situations. In order to understand how to develop resilience, I would like to introduce you to the Stress Bathtub. We would all agree that in order to have a comfortable bath, the water level needs to be just right. Too much water and it will overflow, and too little water and you'll be unable to wash. This analogy can be applied to stress. A bath half full represents an optimal level of stress. Below this water line is an inadequate level of water or stress that will negatively affect your performance, often called rust out, coasting, or comfort zone. The top half of the bathtub represents your buffer zone that the water or stress level can rise through before it overflows, causing the negative outcomes such as breakdown or burnout. Stressful situations in life increase the water level in your bathtub. Take a moment now to think about the stressful situations that can increase the water level in your life's stress bathtub. Some common stresses include death, loneliness or personal injury or, or disease, divorce, 
having a baby, marriage, having to care for someone, job promotion, loss of job, starting a new job, finances, heavy workload, long hours, an unclear role, low job security, low job satisfaction, discrimination, assignments and theses that are due, moving home or homelessness. When the water or stress level in your bathtub is close to overflowing, then your coping net mechanisms are like drain plugs that can decrease the water level back to an optimal level. Take a moment now to think about how you currently manage your stress. Some of your coping strategies can be helpful in that they can greatly reduce the water level in your bathtub and keep it down. While other coping strategies can be unhelpful in that they may lower the water level in the short term, but they ultimately lead to other issues that can cause the water level in your bathtub to rise again. Examples of unhelpful strategies or quick fixes that do not work include alcohol, medication. Research shows that medication on its own was not as effective as when combined with strategies that address thoughts and behaviors in anxious people. Recreational drugs, smoking, procrastination, destruction, thinking everything will be fine, binge or excessive eating on unhealthy food, and superficial self-dialogue such as try to be positive. As stress is a multifactorial issue, it would make sense that a multifactorial approach is needed to address it, taking the whole person into account. There are numerous strategies that have been shown to be helpful in coping with stressful events. Mindfulness is the awareness of what is happening in the present on a moment-by-moment -moment basis and is strongly supported by the research. For me, mindfulness is about attention management. There are so many things that fight for our attention in our modern, multitasking, constantly distracting world that can leave us feeling deple depleted. We all need downtime and an opportunity to recharge. A very affordable and simple way to bring mindfulness into your life is to download a mindfulness app for your mobile device. Having good relationships with family, friends, and or community group aids resilience. Try and find the balance between relying on others and relying on yourself. As the saying goes, laughter is the best medicine. So try and cultivate a sense of playfulness and fun in your life. Nurture a positive view of yourself by developing confidence in your ability to solve problems and trusting your instincts will help re aid resilience and being assertive will further aid this. Accept that change is a part of life. By accepting circumstances that cannot be changed, you can focus on circumstances that you can alter. Keep things in perspective. Even when facing very painful events, try to consider the stressful situation in a broader context and keep a long-term perspective. Avoid blowing the event out of proportion. And there are many other ways to develop resilience depending on the person, and the list here is by no means complete. Also, stop seeing yourself as a victim of your circumstances. Stop being reactive and be creative. 
while you cannot change the fact that highly stressful events happen, believe you can change how you interpret and respond to these events so that you can create the quality of life you want for yourself. A strategy that I have developed and often use is the 3 2 1 exercise or game. Ideally, every night, you and your partner or friend, where possible, can play this quick and easy game. We can play the game right now. Grab a pen and paper and write down your answers to the following question. Firstly, Ask yourself, what three things am I grateful for today? Secondly, ask yourself, what two things did I do well today? And lastly, ask someone else what they think you have done well today. As you are all listening to the webinar right now, I suggest you do this last bit of the game with a colleague, friend, partner or family member and share your list with them. So how can integrated health help you develop resilience? Integrated health looks at the whole person. Our physical therapy services allow us to deal with the physical manifestation of stress in your body. Stress can physically manifest in your body in the form of headaches, tense neck and shoulders, and various musculoskeletal aches and pains. Our physical therapy services can help build physical resilience, providing individuals and organizations with drain plugs for your stress bathtub. But this webinar has been focusing on psychological resilience. And through our personal transformation coaching service, we offer people and organizations the opportunity to deal with the psychological aspects of stress and in turn exercise their psychological resilience muscle by providing drain plugs to your stress factor. I have an analogy of the coaching process that I often share with my clients. As per the image, I see, the coaching, uh, I see the client as a ship facing an iceberg, which represents their stressful situation or issue. Ships tend to be sunk not by the tip of the iceberg, but rather by what lies beneath the surface. In the same way, a person can be sunk by what lies in their subconscious in the form of limiting beliefs and unidentified values. Through the coaching process, we dive deep beneath the surface of the water to explore what these limiting beliefs and unidentified values are so that better choices can be made in facing your challenge. As per the transactional model of stress mentioned earlier, a person's primary appraisal of a situation is shaped by their personal beliefs, values, and goals. And it is through the coaching journey that we develop self-confidence, which for me lies at the heart of developing resilience. For me, coaching is all about the three C's of life. Choices, chances, changes. You must make a choice to take a chance or your life will never change. So today we have looked at what resilience is and its importance, its relationship to stress, how to develop it, and how integrated health can help you develop resilience. Remember, if you choose to see first you can change your reactivity. Many thanks for listening, 
and I'm happy to answer some questions if there is time. And over to you, James. Well, thank you very much, Shadi. It was a very interesting and informative, useful presentation for me particularly. Um, I'm afraid I don't think we've got any time uh, for questions now at the moment. Um, if you keep sending your questions in, we've got uh, quite a few at the moment. Um, I'll send them across to Sadia and Sadia can answer them or we'll stick them up on the website. Um, just to bear in mind the date of our next presentation, Friday the 17th of April, um, which is based on young people and what organizations can do to uh, help manage the work experience process. And, and what you need to do to satisfy some of the work experience requirements um, that some educational establishments uh, sometimes impose. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Sadia. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at our next presentation on Friday the 17th of April. <laughs>